Hey, you guys, I'm super glad to see you. Oh, I guess I have to say, so youth, you guys are dismissed. Elementary kids, uh, you guys are also dismissed. You can all head right out the door over there. I'm super glad to see everybody this morning, although I'm not quite sure why the first three rows are completely empty. What I do know, and any teacher will tell you, it's always the bad kids that sit at the back of the room. So at least, at least I know what I'm dealing with uh, this morning. So, hey, I just want to echo something quickly that uh, Susie shared. A couple things. First of all, uh, you are all, oh, see? Bless you, Brett. God bless Brett. Now he's in the splash zone, though. So <laughs> you don't have to sit there for me. God bless you. So um, I want to echo that you are indeed welcome here. We're awfully glad to have you. Uh, I believe that every time we get together, the Lord wants to do something supernatural in our hearts. And I believe that this morning. I believe there's things he wants to speak to each and every one of us as his kids. He wants to do it from his word. And he wants to do it to us individually, of course. But he wants to do it with us corporately as well. When we gather together as uh, his kids. Um, the other thing I, I want to make sure that you, uh, that you took note of uh, is that this Friday we are trying our very first, we're just calling them a Friday night fellowship. Uh, it's going to be at the Nelson's house, which is in Los Altos, and I'm frankly not exactly sure where. But if you email the church office or give us a quick phone call at the church office, we'll give you the address. We don't want to just be sort of announcing it for all of YouTube to... Uh, to hear, um, but uh, we would love to have you come out, and trust me, the stuff that's on Netflix on Friday night is still going to be on Netflix on Saturday, so you're not going to miss any kind of binge session, That, uh, but just an opportunity to come out and just hang out together and enjoy uh, just an unhurried time of fellowship and just get to know one another. Um, in the bulletin where it said bring a dish to share, that's kind of a loose translation. What it means in the literally in the original language is bring a bag of chips. Bring anything that you can bring uh, just to share with one another. It doesn't have to be anything fancy, but uh, just hope you'll come out on, on Friday night. The other thing that I wanted to mention and I don't know why I'm doing this on a day when I have uh, such an incredibly long message, but I just felt the Lord, um, out in the, in the front lobby, there are, I can't find one of them, there are prayer request cards, yeah, there's some, oh, there are two of them, there we go, prayer request cards and information cards. So if you're with us and you've been coming for a while and you'd just like us to know who you are, um, just let us know your name and maybe your email address. Give us your phone number if you want to, but you don't have to. Uh, and, and certainly, if you have a prayer request, we want to be praying for you every week. We have a prayer team that prays for the needs of the body each and every week. And we would love to know how we can pray for you. Otherwise, we're just going to kind of make it up as we go along. So if you have specific prayer requests, uh, let us know what they are so that we can be praying for you. And um, hasn't the last five weeks been great as the other pastors here at the church have filled in? Uh, I have been so very blessed by the great teaching uh, that I know I've personally enjoyed. You guys have probably enjoyed the 40-minute messages. Um, today we're going to be back up in the 55, 57 neighborhood. So if you have 11, 15 lunch reservations, you might want to push those out just a, a tiny bit. Um, but I love to hear the other men share. I love to hear, you know, Pastor Mike and Pastor Jeff and Pastor Chris share. Love to have Pastor Tosh back in with us sharing the word. And I love it because I think it's just so beautiful to see that wonderful consistency of the word of God paired with the, just the wonderful and the unique gifting of each one of his servants individually and the way that God works and speaks through each one of them. And I know for me, just over these past five weeks, I've been so built up and so ministered to uh, in the spirit by the word. And with that, though, I'm so excited to be back with you this morning uh, here behind the pulpit and ready to continue right on in our study, right where we left off, going through the book of Revelation. If you're just joining us, we've been 
for the past few months probably working our way through the book of Revelation. Um, it's so, sort of ironic that right about the point that we started to make some really good progress is right about the point that I suddenly got so sick. So we're going to be in chapter 10 this morning, so you can go ahead and turn there. Um, if you don't have a Bible, I think... I'm not sure if we're supposed to be handing out Bibles right now, but if you need a Bible, please raise your hand. You can use the one on your phone. You can, uh, we'll give you a copy of it if you need it, but we want you to have God's Word in front of you just so you can double check me as I go. But chapter 10 is a great chapter. It's often called simply the little book. But I think that what we're going to see as we go through this chapter uh, is that maybe a better title, I think, would be the little book with a big message. So let's just pray and ask that the Lord would bless uh, his word this morning. So, Father, we thank you so much for today and we thank you for the opportunity to be here, Lord. I thank you for each one of these who's come, Lord, and who's here. We thank you for each and every person who's watching online, Lord, from home or from travel or for, from wherever it is, Lord. We know you wanna speak to us. Uh, we pray that you would do that this morning, Lord. We pray that the teaching ministry of your Holy Spirit would be manifest here today, Lord. And we pray that you would give us ears to hear what it is that he would say to your church, Lord. What he would say to us individually, Lord, and what he would say to us corporately. And we thank you, Lord, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So finally, as we turn back, right, finally back to the book of Revelation, you may be asking yourselves, now where exactly were we? And if you get the e-bulletin and if you read my little note on Wednesday that some of this might be yet another review for you, but I want to make sure we're all up to speed. We remember back in chapter 1 of the book of Revelation, it began with this glorious revelation or an unveiling, you remember, of the Lord Jesus as we saw him there in his glorified state. And we remember his command that he gave to John in chapter 1, verse 19. He told John to write the things which he had seen, which is that glorious revelation of Jesus, write the things which are and the things which, which must shortly take place after this. So it's this wonderful outline that Jesus himself gives us for this book. You remember then in chapters 2 and 3, we remember as Jesus, the head of the church, addresses those seven separate churches in Asia Minor. And we studied, right, and we savored these two chapters because they really reveal to us the heart of Jesus for his church. And those were the things that are, right? Both the things that are in John's day, as it was those seven specific local churches, but it's also the things which are in our day, as the church, the body of Christ, still exists and is still functioning here on the earth. So the things that are the things of the church. Remember in chapters 4 and 5, the way both the scene and our vantage point shifted from here on earth up into heaven as we joined John up in heaven around the throne of God. And remember we watched as Jesus, the slain lamb, took that seven-sealed scroll because he was the only one found worthy to open it. Right. So now we're going to start to see these are the things which will take place after this. So after the age of the church, now beginning in chapter 4 and on through the rest of the book, all of this is prophetic. All of this is things which will take place after the time of the church, after we are raptured up into heaven to be with the Lord. Chapter 6, we watch the beginning as the first six of the seven seals were taken off the scroll. They were loosed in heaven, and they brought the first series of judgments to the earth. Remember, we witnessed the rise of the coming of the world ruler, the Antichrist, and that false peace that he's going to bring, and then the war and the famine and the destruction that's going to very quickly come in as a result of his unrighteous rule 
over the earth. And then in chapter 7, it was the first of one of what will be a number of those parenthetical passages that are placed within the book of Revelation. And we remember in chapter 7 as the action kind of paused. And remember that we were introduced to two sets of people who it said were sealed by the Lord and who will be protected through those first series, that first series of judgments. And then most recently, as we continued on in chapters 8 and 9, remember we watched as the seventh seal on the scroll was finally opened and it gives way now to the seven trumpets the next series of the judgments that are going to come upon the earth, they will in turn give way eventually to the seven bowls as God's judgments are fully poured out. And as we looked at those trumpet judgments, we noted that the first few of those judgments were physical in, in the way that they had effect on the earth. It, they affected the trees and the grass and the oceans. But then we saw specifically in chapter 9 the way the last two judgments take a turn to really affect the spiritual. Remember, we watched as those locust-like demons were released from captivity in the abyss, and they came down, and they will seize upon, and they're going to torture men, and it will be a time of unprecedented suffering. It's a time when both Satan and his demons will finally be seen for what they really are. They're destroyers of people, although still here restrained by God. God still allowing time for the rebellious to repent. And then we looked on, remember, another one of these kind of prison houses of God were unlocked. And more evil spirits, right, unchained, sent out on this mission of, of terror, we talked about the fact that once they're released, they're going to organize into battle armies of men, it said, totaling 200 million or more soldiers. And this is really the event that sets the stage finally for Armageddon, which we know is the final sort of battle, the final climax of our time. And I know all of this may sound fanciful. It may sound even a little bit crazy, and yet the scriptures are very clear. Paul tells us in Ephesians 6 that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, and powers, and against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And so chapter 9, this last chapter that we'd finished, really gave us another glimpse into that demonic realm and into the power and into the things that are happening there. Now, this morning as we move into chapter 10, just as chapter 7 was a parenthesis, remember it was kind of a brief break in the chronological action, and it described those who would be saved during the tribulation, in the very same way, chapters 10 through chapter 14 are also kind of parenthetical in that the action pauses and we get a bunch of additional background information on the seal and the trumpet and the bowl judgment, judgments. Now, chapter 10, if you read ahead, which I know all of the good students in the front rows did, right? No. If you read ahead, you know that it's kind of a strange chapter, right? It's very often misinterpreted. It's very often misunderstood, but it's really a wonderful chapter, I think, with some wonderful encouragement right from the Lord to us. And it begins with this mighty message from this mighty messenger. It's a mighty angel. Look at verse 1 of Revelation chapter 10. Where John says, and I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head, and his face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. Now remember the word angel in Greek, we talked about the fact that literally it simply means messenger. 
So this messenger here sent from heaven is a pretty interesting one. And as I said, it's, he's caused kind of some confusion over the years because here we have this angel, it says, is clothed with a cloud, with a, a rainbow there on his fed. It's, it said his face was shining like the sun and he had these feet like pillars of fire. Right, so he's shining from head to toe with this radiance and this beauty and this awesomeness, if that's even a word. And all of it certainly sounds pretty similar to that radiance and the beauty and the awesomeness that we saw described Jesus himself in the vision that John saw of Jesus in his glorified state back in chapter 1. And so very often people will simply read through this and they'll quickly conclude that this has to be Jesus. And yet, I don't believe it's Jesus at all for a few specific reasons. First of all, linguistically, it says here that this is another angel. And the word there for another is a very specific Greek word. It's alon or alos. And it means specifically another of the same kind, which tells us that this angel refers to an angel that is just like the seven angels that just blew their trumpets. Not to mention the fact that Jesus himself is like no one else. Right? So according to the language, this angel is just another angel. Although we're going to see he's an awfully big angel. Right? Perhaps he's a mighty Ur angel than the rest. Just dip down into verse 2. We're going to see that John sees this angel, he says, standing on the sea and on the land. And this is where we come into another sort of a difficulty with the possibility that this is Jesus. Because here we have this angel coming down from heaven to the earth. It says he sets one foot on the sea, right? Another foot on the earth. And so this is no small angel, first of all. Right? This is a pretty big fella here, right? And what he does clearly demonstrates heaven's dominion over all the earth. Heaven's dominion over the land. Heaven's dominion over the sea. But again, I don't think this can be Jesus specifically because nowhere do we see Jesus returning to the earth putting his foot down on the earth from the time of his ascension from the earth up into heaven until the time finally at his actual literal second coming to the earth. And this is very significant because first of all, it reminds us that the single great step, if you will, that the entire world is waiting for is the step of Jesus touching down the Bible tells us, upon the Mount of Olives when he returns. And the Bible tells us that when he does put his foot down again on the earth, that the Mount of Olives will immediately, catastrophically split completely into two parts. And that that will open up the way for Jesus to come right in and make his victorious entry into Jerusalem. So if this angel was indeed Jesus... What it would do is it would add yet another coming of Jesus to the earth that we don't see anywhere else foretold in scripture. And another coming of Jesus to the earth that doesn't mesh at all with any of the other biblical descriptions of the second coming. I tell you, it is not at all by accident that when Jesus does return for us, his church, at the rapture of the church, You'll notice very specifically, he does not set foot on the earth, right? What does Paul tell us? He says, in, uh, he says that we who are alive and remain, that we'll be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord where? In the air. And thus we shall always be with him. Okay. Thirdly, I don't think this is Jesus because... The one thing we've, we've already seen in John's writings is that when John sees Jesus, he knows it's Jesus. And every time he sees him, he gives him a very clear and an unmistakable title. 
He calls him the faithful witness or the amen or the alpha and the omega, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David or the lamb. Now, I think what's important about this angel, even though he isn't Jesus, what's important is, that, is to understand that while he isn't God, but this angel has certainly, he is a messenger who has been in the very presence of God. Therefore, he's taken on some of those characteristics, if you will, the, the shining, the radiance, the beauty. He's been in the very presence of God and that this message that he's bringing comes directly from God and is of the utmost importance to God in the same way that it needs to be for us. So let's see what it is. John tells us we have this mighty angel. Look at verses 2 and 3. And it says that he had a little book open in his hand. And he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And he cried out with a loud voice as when a lion roars. And when he cried out, it says that seven thunders uttered their voices. So first of all, we learn that he carries this little book. Now again, lots of speculations as to what is in this little book. Some say that it's another name for that seven-sealed scroll that's now been fully opened up. Some say it's a formerly sealed portion of the book of Daniel, which now is finally opened. And as we continue on in the text today, what we'll learn is that this little book, at its very least, is some sort of a preview for John of the things that are still to come as God pours out his wrath on the earth, that, that it somehow expresses these promises of God that he must fulfill, right? So this book, in a very real sense, in the very least, is the word of God. And I think that what we can say with certainty, whatever message this angel was sent to communicate, this is a message that comes with the absolute authority and the power and the awe of heaven itself. Remember, here he is, this mighty, huge, strong angel, depending on what translation you're reading. He stands there spanning both the land and the sea. He's crying out in a roar that John says is like a lion. And as he does it, these seven thunders roar right along with him. Remember the number seven we've talked about in the Bible once again, is the number usually of completeness or of perfection or of all of something. So we have all of the thunder of heaven and earth joining in with the shout of the angel and this special message. This is an incredibly awesome picture for us to try to picture. But now something very interesting and very puzzling sort of, you know, shakes us out of our little vision there, but I want us not to miss this. Look at verse 4. We're going to spend just a moment here. Verse 4, it says, now when the seven thudders, thudders, thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered and do not write them. Now, I think this is fascinating. Right? So some of the psalmists and, and the prophets and Job, even John elsewhere, they describe for us this idea of the very voice of God being like a thunder. And so here we see the, the voice of God, right? This thunder from heaven makes what John believes is an important declaration, Right? Whatever this thunder was, it was intelligible and it was important so much so that John believed he needed to start writing down exactly what was said. And yet, John was told to seal it up, right? to not reveal the words of these seven thunders. It's actually the only revelation in the book of Revelation that is sealed. And so... No one knows what the thunders said. 
Does anybody here know what the thunder said? Please don't raise your hands, right? <laughs> because I hope you don't, because nobody knows. At least nobody here on earth. Right? Nobody knows what the seven, seven thunder said. John is the only mere man who ever did know what the seven thunder said, and he took that information with him to his death and then up into heaven, right, upon his death, and yet it probably won't surprise you when I tell you that there are papers written, there are entire commentaries devoted. Some cults have written extensive volumes and even based entire doctrines on what wasn't said here. And I don't think I have to tell you how dangerous that can be. The, the question I have is why even speculate about it when you have no hope at all of knowing? I mean, you could make the best case ever, this conclusive point proven beyond, you know, and yet none of it is more than a theory and it's an exercise in futility. And my point is that it's not important anyway. But I do think there is a very important truth for each one of us personally, precisely in what isn't recorded, because I believe that this is a very significant reminder placed significantly right here, right in the middle of this book. Chapter 10 of 21 chapters, this is a very specific reminder that there are some things that we simply are not going to know. And that drives some people crazy. Right? Some people seem to feel like we need to know everything. We need to solve every problem. We need to unknot every difficult situation. We need to understand every nuance. And I have to tell you, maybe it's just because I'm not super smart, but I'm so thankful that early on in my Christian life, I realized that for my own sense of sanity and my own sense of security, that I was going to need to get used to a certain amount of mystery in my relationship with the Lord. Because it's like that old saying goes, right? Any God who's small enough for us to fully understand isn't big enough for us to fully worship. Or the saying goes something like that. Maybe it was said better than that. But right, a God who's small enough for us to understand would have to then be smaller than our small minds. And if he's smaller than our small minds, then that means he's automatically smaller than us, and why in the world would I ever worship somebody who's even smaller than I am? So anytime you have the finite, right, you and I, anytime you have the finite in relationship with the infinite, then you've got to get used to there being some mystery. Way back in the book of Deuteronomy, it says that the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. I want you guys to make a note of that verse, right? Deuteronomy 29, 29. Make a note of it, look it up later, maybe put it up on your wall at home, right? Maybe even make a t-shirt of it, right? Wouldn't that be a great verse for a church t-shirt? And my point is that so many Christians spend so much time trying to figure out what God hasn't clearly said to us that I'm afraid that they miss out completely on just kind of putting into play in their lives the things that God has revealed in his word. Don't you find that that alone is a big enough project without getting off entangled about lost books of the Bible and Bible codes and secret messages that, I mean, rest assured, the Bible tells us plainly everything we need to know. I know that we're all very familiar with Paul's very powerful declaration to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, where Paul says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for doctrine and for reproof and for correction and for instruction in righteousness. You've all heard that verse, right? But maybe we're not quite as familiar 
with what he declares next is the very purpose of those scriptures. In verse 17, he says that this is given that the man or that the servant of God may be complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work. So we're given the scriptures not that we would be partially equipped or nearly equipped or that we would be almost equipped, but this book thoroughly and completely equips us and prepares us for us to do anything and everything that the Lord calls us to do and to do those things that it pleases him as we do them. So whatever it was that these seven thunders uttered, do you realize that not knowing is no detriment to your Christian walk? Not knowing what the seven thunders said is not at all affecting your effectiveness for the Lord. The word of God, you guys, is so perfect. Think about this. What God does in his word is he supernaturally takes every single thing about every single doctrine and he takes it right to the line where we will understand it with the greatest clarity on any particular subject. But God knows that for him to go even one inch beyond that point would just start to introduce confusion for our finite minds. And that's the truth. So what God does is he tells us what it is that we really need to know. And if we really need to know what those seven thunders said in order to be better Christians than we are, or to be better ministers than we are, then God would surely have told us. And all of this is so important because we as Christians need to remember we should never ever feel pressured to speak into God's silence. It's very important for us to honor the silences of God, right? The things that he doesn't say along with those things that he does say. And to know that there are always reasons for this. Again, I know I'm tripping out about this, but I think it's interesting to consider that John was told that we don't need to know what the seven thunders said, but apparently, because it's recorded here, apparently we did need to know that they said something that God thinks that we don't need to know. Right? Why even include it? Why is it that the Lord wouldn't want us to know some of these things? Well, there's lots of possible reasons, right? But first of all, in a sense, it keeps us humble, doesn't it? Because right about that point where we think we have all the answers, we start to get puffed up. And yet the Lord desires that we be like the psalmist. In Psalm 131, the psalmist says, Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor my eyes lofty, neither do I concern myself with great matters, nor with things that are too profound for me. So let's concern ourselves with the things that he would have us to be concerned with, the things that he has revealed to us. But not only, I think, does God sometimes keep things from us to keep us humble, but also to keep us stable. And what I mean by that is that it's in the face of the most challenging difficulties in life when we can become very vulnerable. Our faith at that point can become very shaky because it's at those times when we start asking, why God? Or what's going on here, Lord? And we start questioning rather than simply trusting him. And so what God does to take care of this problem is that instead of promising us that we would understand all things, what does he promise us? He promises that he can supply us with the peace that what? That surpasses or that passes that understanding. And that comes to us as we trust him who does understand all things. And I know I've said this before, you probably think it's too simple, and yet it's so important as we struggle in life with those things that we don't understand, that we simply rely on the things that we do understand, right? that we need to turn back and rely on who we do understand and rely on his grace and his mercy and his love that we know he has 
for each one of us. Rely on the fact that he will never leave us and that he will never forsake us. Rely on that promise, right, that he, who, that he has begun this good work in us and that because he's begun it, he is going to complete it. Right? We need to rely on the assurance that Paul tells us in the letter to the Romans that all things do work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. Right? We need to rely on the fact that no matter what we are going through, that Jesus would have us to know and to trust that he is fully in control. And that he will fulfill those purposes in our lives. And if we can rely on all of that, really, shouldn't that be enough? Rather than worrying about all these things that the Bible doesn't say, let's be focused on the things that it does say. I know I spent a little extra time on that. But that's something that the Spirit really spoke to me this week. And I want to make sure that, uh, that he speaks to you. Because next we're going to see as we move ahead in our text, we're going to see that this dramatic introduction that we've just seen in the first four verses was this sort of a preparation for this pronouncement that's going to come now in the next few. It's another very important truth for us. Whatever it was that those seven thunders said, the mighty angel now says, it says in verse 5, the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land, lifted up his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever and who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, that there should be delay no longer. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished as he declared to his servants the prophets. So here this incredible scene, right, continues. This angel lifts up his hand to heaven and he affirms that there will be delay no longer. Remember back in chapter 6, there were those souls that John said were under the altar and they asked, how long? And remember that the answer then was wait, but the answer now is now. Now is the time. Peter predicts that scoffers, right, will continue to ask, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 4, where is the promise of his coming? In other words, where's the Lord, right? Why isn't God doing something about all the things that we see happening? And even we as believers, if we're honest, right, we can find ourselves struggling with these same kinds of questions. But here's an assurance by, through this heavenly messenger that in the days of the seventh trumpet that God will finish his program. In other words, it is that seventh trumpet that's going to bring about this accomplishing of what it says there in verse 7, the mystery of God. And so surely will this happen that this mighty angel swears this oath by the true and living God. He swears an oath by the creator of all things. In other words, think of it this way. The angel says, what I'm about to swear in this oath, in this name, is so sure to come to pass that I can't swear it by any other higher name to make this kind of a guarantee that the mystery of God will be accomplished. Now that sounds pretty important, doesn't it? That kind of an oath, that kind of a declaration. Now understand, the term mystery in the Bible isn't really that mysterious. In the Bible, a mystery is simply something that's now revealed that was once concealed. And this mystery, it says here, had previously been announced to God's prophets. So what was it that God had declared both to and through his faithful prophets all the way through the Old Testament? Well, it was the fact that Jesus Christ will return again to the earth. 
that God will establish his kingdom here on the earth and that it's going to be a righteous kingdom and it's going to be a peaceful kingdom. And so the mystery is simply the fulfillment of all of these Old Testament passages that talk about the second coming of Jesus Christ and the establishing of the kingdom. We're going to see as we come to chapter 11, I love the way it's described. It says that the seventh angel sounded. There were loud voices in heaven saying that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now, I understand that it is easy for us to look at these kinds of biblical truths Right? We look at them with our, our completed Bibles right, open on our laps. And we can look at these things and we could almost take them for granted. And we say, well, of course Jesus is going to return. But what I think we need to remember is that for God's people, for thousands of years, this was still a mystery. They didn't understand necessarily how all of these things were possibly going to work out. And that, to me, is a huge encouragement for my life. And I think it should be for yours, too. As we look at this crazy world globally and all the things that are going on around us, as we look at maybe some of the things personally that are happening to us individually in our own lives, and we can ask these same questions, how in the world, Lord, is this possibly going to work out? And I think this reminds us that God's purposes and his promises and his plans, we can't necessarily understand them as we look around at what we see happening in this world, as we look around and we see the kind of power, right, the kind of manifestation that Satan is allowed to have. And yet, in the midst of all of that, we need to rest assured that the time will come when Satan is no longer in that kind of power. The time will come when all of these predictions in the Old Testament made by those prophets that they will be fulfilled or that time will come when all of those promises of the word of God are going to be fulfilled in each of our own lives. You know, as, as simple-minded men, maybe we can't understand why sin and suffering are allowed the way they are in the world. It's hard for us to understand why good believers suffer and why rebellious sinners seem to go free and, and to prosper. But while we may not understand, we can be sure and we can rest in the fact that God will eventually straighten all of these things out and he will complete his program. And we know this much, that God is in control of history and he will ultimately see that right triumphs over wrong. And we can be confident of this. Why? Because of his word. Because of the word that he's given to each one of us. And, and if you are a person that comes to church regularly, especially if you come here regularly, you may get to the point where you are getting a little bit tired, and I don't mean this with this, maybe you're getting a little bit tired of hearing how sure and how reliable God's word is. Because sometimes it can seem like we as pastors, we just keep preaching the same message, right? We keep pointing back, and we keep pointing back, and we keep pointing back to the word. And you may feel like you're looking for a little something more, right? You're looking for something a little bit new. And I get it. But what I want you to do is imagine, just for a moment, imagine your life without your Bible. And imagine your life without all those old truths that we just sort of take for granted as we seek out and look for something that's new and exciting. Take just the ones that we already mentioned. All those things that we understand because they've been revealed to us in God's word. 
his grace and his mercy and his love and the fact that he will never leave us or forsake us and the fact that promise that he has begun this good work in us and that he'll continue to be doing it. That assurance that he's working all things together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. And we can so easily take all those old truths for granted except that they have now become the new foundation for our new lives in Christ. The word is unchanging. Right? It's sure and it's solid and it is increasingly the only thing, isn't it, that is unchanging and solid and the only thing that we can depend upon. All you have to do is take a quick glance at church history or look at the persecuted church of the present and just to be reminded that people have died for the word of God. People treasure the word of God. They long for it. There's such a shortage of it. And there are so many people right now on this planet who so desperately want to know it and they can't get a hold of it. And yet how easily we have access to it. And I think what we're going to see next is such a strong encouragement that it's not just enough to have it, that what God really desires and what we need is that his word become a part of us. Right? All of it, right? Both the encouraging parts as well as the warnings. And so moving on, right? We've just seen that in his mercy, God sends this angel, right? With a final warning. This is your last warning, right? The time is up. There will be no more delay. There will be no more waiting, no more space to repent. We are now going to bring this thing forward in earnest, just like God promised that he would. And now we see that John is told to do something really strange. But again, so important for us to understand and I think to take to our hearts. It says in verse 8 that then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again. And said, go, take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So this book that's open is literally, the little book is literally a little scroll. And again, it's not the scroll that the father just handed to Jesus earlier. This is a word for a smaller kind of scroll that they're talking about here. And so the voice tells John to take the scroll from the angel, verse 9. John says, And I went to the angel, and I said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. Now, at first glance, this certainly seems like one of those stranger passages of Scripture. And What exactly is happening here? Well, you'll be glad to know that we are not told exactly what's happening here. And yet it seems certainly on the surface, right, that in eating this book that John was taking in, right, he was digesting what the book says. We see a very similar picture, Jeremiah chapter 15. Jeremiah says, your words were found and I ate them. And so right here, it's a, a clear reminder for us as believers that we need to be taking in, right? We need to be feeding on the word of God in order to really be growing in our relationship with God, right? Doesn't the Bible itself say of itself that it's our food, right? In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus quotes the Old Testament. He says, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So we need to take it in and we need to chew on it. And we need to digest it, really make it a part of ourselves before it can do us any good, right? A healthy meal doesn't do me any good unless I actually eat it and let, you know, get all the nutrients and, and all of that stuff. You guys are smart and you get all of that, right? It's always good to read the Bible. It's good to study the Bible. But can I just encourage you, 
we also need to really be meditating on the Bible. We need to be memorizing the Bible to really digest it inwardly through the power of the Holy Spirit. I can tell you in my own walk that I believe that my greatest growth comes in times when I am actively engaged in memorizing the scriptures on a daily basis. Because if you've done it, you know there is something that happens as we meditate and as we kind of ruminate on the word. That's how it really becomes part of us. And I want you to give this a try this week. Write down a verse on a piece of paper or on a post-it note or whatever and just put it in your pocket and work on memorizing it by repeating it over and over, line by line, throughout the day. And I think what you're going to find is that not only are you going to remember it, but just in that act of repeating it and thinking about it, that the Spirit is going to supernaturally increase your understanding of it. Right, so come next week and tell me the verse you memorized as you get here to church. And if you go in the side door, then I'll know. So all of this, right? You're taking in, you're digesting the word of God. It's so important. And I think it's so easily evident right here from what John experiences. And yet specifically in the context of this passage, there's some imagery here that's very important. And it comes right from God's commissioning of Ezekiel, right? Ezekiel chapter two and three. Right, the Lord takes and he gives his word there to Ezekiel and he commissions him to prophesy to these rebellious children of Israel. In Ezekiel chapter 2, he says this. It's, it's long, but it's worth it. He says, you shall speak my words to them, whether they hear or whether they refuse, for they are rebellious. But you, son of man, hear what I say to you. Do not be rebellious like the rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. Now when I looked, there was a hand stretched out to me, and behold, a scroll of a book was in it. Then he spread it before me, and there was writing on the inside and the outside. And written on it were lamentations and mourning and woe. Going on into chapter 3. It says, Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, eat what you find. Eat this scroll and go Speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that scroll. And he said to me, Son of man, feed your belly and fill your stomach with this scroll that I give you. And so I ate, and it was in my mouth like honey in sweetness. And then finally, at the end of this account, and down in verse 14, Ezekiel adds, he says that the Spirit lifted me up and took me away, and I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit. So here's John, just like Ezekiel, and he obeys, and his experience is just like the angel said that it would be, right? The word on the scroll that was given to him, it was sweet like honey in his mouth, but then once it got into his belly, right, as he really began to digest and to understand what was written there, then it became a sourness and a bitterness. And notice with John, just like Ezekiel, all of this was a necessary part of his preparation for what God had called him to do, right? That he had to prophesy again about many peoples and nations and tongues and kings, right? That he would prophesy about these events that were about to unfold, writing them down in this book for us to read here this morning, and it was the reality of what was so sure to come to pass that was both sweet in his mouth, but it was also bitter in his stomach. You see, for each and every child of God, right, any one of us that live for God or serve the Lord or speak for him or, you know, to the world, there's this combination Right, of us being faithful to communicate God's message of judgment, 
right? That his kingdom is going to come. It is going to be established. Ultimately, that God is going to win. And as we partake of the word in that sense, there's such a sweetness of the knowledge of that truth in our mouths, right? And yet at the very same time, there's a bitterness that should be in the pit of our stomach deep inside of us when we really understand that the only way that God is going to be able to establish this fabulous, righteous, beautiful kingdom, because man is so wicked and so rebellious, that the only way that God can bring this about is this kind of judgment that we're reading about here in these chapters because of the stubbornness and just the outright rebellion of man against God. And so it's a very bitter truth, isn't it, for us to look around and to really understand what it is that the lost in this world will be facing. Right? There's a sweetness because we know it's coming, but there's a bitterness because we understand how God has to get there. And yet on the flip side sort of of the coin, we can look around in this world and there are things for us to see that are so hard to believe, right? They're, they're painful to understand right? when we look at some of the suffering that's happening. And yet, those things, even those things, should become not so much of a struggle for us when we're reminded, like we talked about before, that we're just not smarter than God. Right? We look at these things we don't understand, we fall back on the things we do understand, which is that we know God to be gracious. We know God to be righteous. We know that if God will save me, that he'll save anybody. And we know those things to be true and we rejoice in those things. And so there's such a sweetness in all that. But in terms of what we know is ahead for this world, what we know is ahead for the loss and those who continue to reject the Lord, we certainly don't rejoice in that. Because there's a bitterness that this reality brings. And I don't know if you remember, remember when God used the Assyrians and he used the Babylonians to bring judgment against the southern kingdom of Judah. And he used them to bring this judgment of Judah. And you remember that some of those surrounding peoples, the Moabites and the Edomites and the Ammonites and the Philistines, they sort of piled on to this judgment. They kind of added even more judgment against the Jews than God had intended. They kind of joined with the Babylonians, rejoicing and helping them in vengeance with this pillaging of Jerusalem, and they were really enjoying the destruction of their enemies. And God let it happen. But then later, God speaks through his prophets to those neighboring nations, and he says basically, okay, because you piled on, right, because you rejoiced in me judging these people, God says, I'm now going to judge you because of your attitude. And the point here is that God takes no pleasure in his judgment, right? He does only what he knows he needs to, and he does what he knows he has to do, and he doesn't go one inch even beyond that point. And at the very same time, and I hope that what we've seen as we've gone through this book so far, is that in his wrath, he always remembers mercy. We've seen him over and over restraining his judgment, right? Sending these judgment in waves just so he can allow for an opportunity for the rebellious to still repent. You know, we read about all that's going to happen. We know it is going to be happen. There's no joy in our hearts over that. We are joyful, right, that the kingdom and, and, and what it's all going to mean, but we're so sad in the reality of the fact that to birth that kingdom that these judgments have to happen. And that's just the bittersweet reality that every child of God, every servant of the Lord lives with. That's what John's experiencing here. And as we close, and I know it's late, I promised you we would be, I want to say this quickly, though, that the very same thing can be true in our own lives. 
because we are all quick to rejoice about what it is that we know that the Lord has promised to do in our lives personally. Right? Romans 8, 20, 29 says that he is conforming us more and more each day into the image of his son. What could be better than that, right? We know, in effect, that the kingdom is coming in our own lives. And that truth is a pretty sweet truth, isn't it? And yet we so often, the way that we have to get there, that can be kind of a bitter reality, isn't it? Right? There is joy and sorrow, there is sweetness and there's bitterness, there's gladness and there's sadness, as God's word does its perfect saving and sanctifying work in each of our lives. Whether it's through judgments that God sends on us directly, whether it's through difficulty that he allows, all of which he's using to purify us. Right? It might be sickness, it might be opposition, it might be some other kind of a trial that we just don't understand why it's happening, and yet it's in those moments that we trust in him. And we trust in his grace and his goodness and his mercy. We trust that he is righteous. And we trust that he knows that these difficulties in our lives, that they are a necessary part of working out those purposes that he has for us, right? That he's birthing in us this new kingdom inside of us and that these bitter things are just a part of that process. And so whatever it is that you're dealing with today, whatever it is that you are up against or going through or the things that you don't understand that seem to be happening to you, I just really want to encourage you to do what I have, I guess, needed to relearn how to do, which is just trust the Lord with that thing. Right, to just give it over completely to him, to entrust it to him and focus and meditate and then ruminate on those things that you do know to be true about him. That he is good and he is gracious and that he will never leave you because of his great love for you. And that all of these things are simply because he is working out something so great in you, greater than you can imagine. Amen? Amen. So, Father, we thank you for this morning, and we do thank you, Lord, for your word and the way that it helps us, Lord, simply to frame, Lord, the way that it helps to adjust our perspective as we Look on so often, Lord, with confusion about the things that we see happening in this world, Lord, the things that we are experiencing, Lord, that are happening uh, in our own lives. And so, Lord, we pray that, um, Lord, that these that was it would drive us back to your word, Lord, and to those assurances uh, of your love for us, Lord, and your presence in our lives. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.